Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled Intellectual Property in the Life Sciences Industry, How to Identify and Manage Patent Risks. I'm Courtney Young, an attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenter, Alexander August, thank you for joining us. Dr. August advises clients in a wide variety of IP matters with a focus on procurement and commercialization of patent portfolios in a broad range of biomedical technologies. His background in academic technology transfer and his previous experience gained at an international law firm provide him with a deep understanding of the needs of a variety of clients, from academic institutions to startups and large corporations. Prior to joining his current firm, Dr. Ox was an associate at an international law firm where his practice focused on patent prosecution in the biopharma space and IP diligence in large commercial transaction. Previously, he was an IP licensing manager at a major Boston area hospital where he performed business and IP analyses of inventions predominantly in the medical device space, prepared marketing materials, and negotiated and prepared a variety of agreements related to technology transactions. Dr. Ox obtained his PhD from Imperial College London, where he developed computational models of blood flow and arteries based on 3D ultrasound imaging. Subsequently, he was a postdoctoral researcher at Imperial College London, MIT, and Harvard University, where he performed research in the areas of cell and tissue engineering and biomedical interactions. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Dr. Ox, who will begin today's presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone, to our uh, webinar presentation today on intellectual property in the life sciences industry with a focus on how to identify and manage patent risks. What I will cover today is a very high level overview of a bunch of issues that come up in early as well as late stage companies relating to intellectual property, more specifically to patents, and by that I mean patent procurement, portfolio management, litigation, and all the other related uh, issues that can, can come up with a developing or developed patent portfolio. That's why I think it's best to start off with a brief patent primer, especially for those who may not be that familiar with the patent world and patent uh, landscape, and explain a little bit more about what patents do and don't. Uh, for some of you, this may be old news, and for some, this may be uh, all completely new, and hopefully I will uh, be able to address both sides of the, of the coin here. Um, then we will dive into some of the uh, most common risks associated with third-party patents, i.e. patents held by not you, but someone else, uh, relating to issues like freedom to operate. Um, and we'll talk a bit about uh, different scenarios, depending on who is the holder of these patents, be it competitors, partners, targets, and others. Then we'll turn over to uh, risks that may be associated with the patent portfolio uh, that you or your company holds. Um, there are issues, of course, and potential risks associated with those. Uh, so we will talk a little bit about coverage of your own um, product and product portfolio, uh, but also issues relating to your coverage of potentials, potentially someone else's or a competitor's product. And finally, we'll wrap it up with the, um, a few more specific pointers uh, to um, some simple steps that you can take to mitigate some of the potential risks uh, associated with um, either your own patents or, uh, or, or patent portfolios held by third parties. So let's uh, dive right into it. Um, first, I will give you a short patent primer. For some of you, again, this might be a refresher. For some, this may be something completely new. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to sort of touch on um, just the key issues um, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the patent life cycle and what it does and doesn't do. So going right into it, it's probably most important to understand from the get-go about what a patent does and what it doesn't do. And the reason why I'm starting here is because that seems to be uh, sometimes a bit of a misconception about um, what a patent does. I've had uh, clients or potential clients walk up to me and say, well, you know, I have a patent on this, X, Y, Z. That means I can do whatever I want with it. Well, that's not entirely correct. Um, going back to, this, to the second point, a patent is a right to exclude someone else from doing something. It's not a right to practice something. 
that's a very, very important to, um, to understand. Um, so the, um, um, the, the, the patent really is a fence, so to speak, to keep someone else out of what is inside that fence. And what is inside that fence is described in the patent itself. So looking at a patent, some of you may be very, again, very familiar. Some of you may have never seen one. If you look at it, it's usually a um, um, between two pages and several hundred pages document um, that consists basically always of the same individual components. One is, broadly speaking, the specification and drawings, which is a lot of text that uh, explains to the reader what the invention covered in this patent does and is and how it's made, ideally, and uh, how it's used and whatnot, uh, usually backed up with a one or sometimes hundreds of drawings, depending on the um, on the type of invention. And the second, the most more critical part, really is uh, is what's in the claims. So the claims are often just a page, maybe two, sometimes even just a paragraph, uh, enumerating in numbered paragraphs what the invention or the, the, the coverage of this invention really entails in this, in this patent. Uh, usually on a separate page, the, um, uh, the claims are uh, introduced with the phrase of what is claimed is or we claim, and then, it's, uh, and then uh, we see a list of paragraphs that start something like one, a system for doing X or a method of doing Y. And it's really what's in these claims that is the essence of the patent that defines what that fence that we just talked about really is, what, it, what is fenced in by this. Not what, 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 is, what is in those 200 pages of specification and drawings, but it's really in these claims. That's what is, what is the definition of the invention and what is, what is uh, um, the, the, the scope of protection that this um, patent um, conveys what is, these are really what is embodied in the rights to exclude others from doing something that is in these claims. So it is important to understand also that patents are regional rights. So um, often enough, uh, there's sometimes a misconception about where and how um, patents work, it is important to understand that a U.S. patent, for example, that will say so on the front page, United States patent, is only valid and enforceable in the United States. Um, patents are regional, they are and by, not necessarily national, but they are regional. So, for example, the U.S. has its own patents. The European Union is already a little different. Um, the uh, European Patent Office is um, a, a body that provides a patent prosecution method of a European patent application that, once allowed, then needs to be, so shall we say, transferred or validated, as we call it, in the various uh, member countries of the European Patent uh, um, Office, member states. And those are not necessarily the same as the European Union. So then there's, there's, there's overlap, of course, but uh, they don't exactly match. And there, there, there's a trend, side note, uh, now to, to, to hopefully have a unified European patent sometime in the near future. Um, we will see if, if and when that's really going to happen. But uh, for, for now, the, the process is, is a, a European prosecution process, but then a national validation process. Similarly, um, again, China, Japan, you name it, Asian countries usually have their own national patent system. So it's important to, 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 to keep those, two, um, to, those concepts in mind that this fence that you're building with your, um, with your patents and patent applications uh, only works in the, in the designated countries where you filed and applied for a patent. There are international applications that are placeholders, so to speak, that can be used to preserve rights, but um, uh, those are usually just uh, a, sort of a, a, a step between, uh, a step on the way to obtaining a national patent in respective jurisdictions. So as I already 
briefly alluded to, um, the, um, it's important to understand the patent life cycle. Uh, then that that is pretty much the same in the U.S. and internationally. Um, so there are really two main phases in a. Um, in the life of a patent, uh, one is uh, the, the process of obtaining a patent, of filing an application and getting it through uh, to allowance and thus issuance of a patent. And then the second part of the patent life is when the patent is actually issued. But just because a patent has issued, it does not necessarily mean uh, it stays there and sits there forever and sitting pretty. It can actually be challenged. So. Nothing is forever, even even in the patent world. Um, of course, keeping in mind that a patent itself usually is limited to a lifetime of, of, of 20 years from filing, be it in the U.S. and in most other jurisdictions in the world. So, uh, looking, uh, take a quick look um, at the um, patent life cycle. Uh, I will introduce a few terms for the, 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 the patent newbies that we will be talking a little bit more later. We we'll keep, keep cropping up. Um, so. The first step, as I just mentioned, is obtaining the patent. So the way uh, this works is that uh, you know, the, um, the idea, the, the, the invention is captured in words, drawings, uh, whatever supporting information uh, we, one needs to uh, convey to a what we call the person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, to make uh, use or understand the invention. And that is often done by professionals such as myself. Uh, then then we, we, we take the sometimes a short document that our client or the inventor provides um, or, or, or sometimes a more fleshed out document, say a scientific pu uh, publication draft or something along those lines, and turn this uh, uses as a basis to draft the patent application, draft the specification, uh, prepare the drawings, and most importantly, draft the claims. Once that is ready, we will then file the patent uh, application with, for example, the United States Patent Office, and um, we so present it to the office, and what the office will then do uh, is it, it will examine this application, most importantly, the claims, of course. And uh, this, this prosecution process can take several months, can take years and years and years. And the way it usually works is, for those who haven't been through it, is that the, we, 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 we throw them, so to speak, the patent application at the, at the patent office. The, the patent office takes a look and says, well, that looks well and good, but here are a few problems for them with, with your claims. Your invention is, for example, in our opinion, not novel. It's obvious over uh, a, 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 a bunch of reference publications you know, that put together would disclose your invention. Or there are some other issues. It re, it's, for example, directed non, to non-patentable subject matter. So there are all these uh, rejections um, that um, uh, a, a patent can, application can experience throughout prosecution, and sometimes um, in these, these, these rejections read horribly. They think, oh my God, we'll never get a patent on, on, on this issue. Well, usually then we, the applicant has the chance to amend or argue or both um, the, the patentability of their respective uh, claims. And uh, this, this back and forth between the office and the applicant happens. Uh, sometimes once, twice, several times, um, until the, 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 either the, the, uh, the examiner is satisfied and allows and eventually issues the patent, or uh, in some cases the, the, the applicant might say, you know, uh, this is not working, the, the claim scope as it changes throughout prosecution through amendments uh, is not, no longer relevant, no longer interesting, we just abandon the application. So once, um, however, the patent issues, hopefully, uh, it's, uh, it sits at the uh, Patent and Trademark Office, it's issued, um, maintenance fees are payable in the U.S. and most jurisdictions to keep this patent alive, so to speak, over the, the 20 years that it has from filing. However, uh, again, a, a patent in, um, uh, be it in the U.S., be it in other jurisdictions, is subject to uh, challenges. So 
either the, um, in most cases, a, another party, or even the patent owner themselves can um, have a, uh, another go at getting this patent either changed or knocked out all, uh, altogether. There are several post-grant proceedings before the USPTO, um, so-called post-grant review or inter-parties uh, examination, um, the IPRs for short, that are um, uh, available to uh, a potential patent challenger to knock this patent out um, for, for, whatever, uh, for whatever reason that we might talk a little bit more about later. And of course, there are also challenges in district court uh, litigation as, uh, as, as part of a larger, for example, infringement lawsuit. There are also ways to challenge patents there. So, assuming, however, that you do have your patent or somebody has their patent, what can they or you do with it? So, um, we often like to think of you know, patents as assets. And they definitely are, whether they are property or not, are subject to debate, but they most certainly are assets or even the right to uh, use, uh, for example, under a license to the patent rights, uh, use or uh, have other kind of rights to, to, to exploit this patent or patent application uh, can be extremely, extremely valuable. Um, there are, of course, not few instances where the patent estate, and sometimes it can be just a single patent, are the only assets that, especially an early stage company, uh, be it in the life sciences or, or, or else, really has. So, um, driving the value, of course, of, of that company. Um, company the, uh, the company may or may not um, buy, sell, trade patents, just as other, like other assets. Um, there are ways to, to monetize or, 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 or use the, um, the, uh, the, in the IP rights in the, in the patents as kind, some kind of um, uh, piece of a larger transaction. There are uh, hundreds of thousands of ways of doing it. So uh, that, that's what I'm saying there. That's not just for the, the, the classic you know, assignment, which is like a sale, or license, which is more like a renting it out, so to speak. Or um, then, then, then there are thousands of different ways of, of, of using them. Um, and again, especially given the fact that a patent can be, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, uh, can be used for, um, for offensive and defensive purposes. So what do we what do I mean by that? Um, so the an off some people you know, have different definitions of offensive versus defensive patenting, but um, broadly speaking, I like to think about it is that an, that patents can be used for offense in terms of. Um, inflicting some kind of damage, so to speak, or making life difficult for a potential competitor in your field. Um, sometimes aimed at a specific competitor or uh, in an attempt to ex obtain extremely broad coverage, are you having a so-called broad claim in your patent that covers as many potential competitor products or technologies as possible? Um, then that's, that's one way of, of really driving the value of your patent portfolio. And the other is the defensive aspect. Playing defense with your patents is more directed to um, the protection coverage of your own core technology. Yeah. So, so really, um, what is sort of the, um, uh, the, uh, the nugget that we're trying to, 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 to protect and as, as, as well and as solidly as, as possible um, to prevent, for example, um, as, as a, 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 um, uh, a copycat straight up copying our product. So, and of course, sometimes you know, certain patents, of course, in an ideal case, uh, fulfill both requirements and, uh, and can be used for, uh, for, for, for both offensive and defensive um, uh, business endeavors. Okay, so I think hopefully this was um, uh, helpful to, to to most of you to um, kind of get up to speed on 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 on, on the patents and get some of the uh, dynamic nomenclature uh, out when we talk about applications and claims and uh, and issued patents versus applications um, to to understand what's going on in the uh, when we start looking at some issues associated with third party patents. So the issue that we often encounter that may I would assume pretty much everybody's familiar with is the issue of patent infringement. So, patent, so infringement uh, occurs, and I should maybe sort of really 
take things really as a, as a basic level here. Infringement occurs when uh, a, um, an, an activity occurs that reads in some shape or form on the uh, on an issued issued patent claim. I.e., if um, a uh, and the alleged infringer um, makes use sells offers for sale. All this kind of stuff can be infringing activity of, say, a product that is covered by an, an, an issued invalid patent claim. And of course, that is uh, potentially a problem uh, if that patent claim is not held by the person who's practicing the, um, the invention, who is making or selling the, the, the thing, the widget in question, but is held by someone else, a third party. So, the, um, as I said, Patents are rights to exclude someone from doing it, not the right to practice something. So um, we are faced with an issue that's called freedom to operate. A main concern that, uh, that uh, in, concern number one that one has in the context of third-party patents is: Do we have freedom to operate? I.e., do we not infringe someone else's patent claims? And um, so that, this can be in a, in a, in a variety, an issue in a variety of scenarios. Uh, these can involve um, competitors, very common, of course. But this can also be an issue for targets in, for example, M&A transactions. Um, even in friendly, quote unquote, friendly uh, transactions, such as um, partnerships uh, in co-developments, other relationships you, one may have with CROs with um, um, universities, with 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 co-developers, you name it, sometimes can be an issue, and sometimes helps, uh, has to be um, um, has has to be addressed uh, in, in terms of um, are there potential problems created by the fact that this partner uh, have even though we're good friends has patent rights, enforceable rights to something that uh, we might have. Um, uh, we, 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 we may want to practice in some shape or form. The little side issue we, now that we're talking about um, partners and co-developers, um, often enough these also are tied in with issues of who owns what, i.e., who's um, uh, who's you know, who, who actually has the enforceable right. Is it really just the third party, or maybe uh, is that is the situation more complicated? And of course, there are also other um, third parties. Um, probably the most most um, most common that you may have heard of is the so-called NPEs, non-practicing entities, uh, sometimes referred to as patent trolls. These are entities that uh, are often purely in the business of. Um, Acquiring uh, the rights to certain patents and patent applications in order just to sue uh, someone uh, else, a, a, and often several uh, potential uh, targets for um, uh, usually for settlement money of and, and uh, accusing these companies of infringement. Probably the most common issue that we face with um, when we look at talk about third-party patents are patents held by competitors or potential competitors. So, um, again, as I said several times already, and, and, and pardon my, my repeating myself, is that really um, the patent is a tool to keep someone else out from doing something. And of course, every competitor, uh, every um, uh, Every third party that is in the same space as, say, you, your, 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 your own company, um, there may be just one, there may be several, may have different, their own different um, strategies and uh, you know, how they um, how they approach their their their, their patent filing um, and patent patent filing strategy. Um, it de depends on what kind of product they uh, the, um, the the competitor is, is developing. Is it a, is it a tool? Is it a pharmaceutical? Um, is it software? The whole comes with its all a host of issues. Um, it may depend on on the business plan and also, quite frankly, on the budget. Because something I uh, I should have probably mentioned earlier is that you know, patent prosecution is a costly business. Uh, there are, of course, government fees associated with it, but um, uh, quite frankly, a lot of it goes to um, the um, respective law firms or or you know or, or, or in-house patent counsel that has to be um, paid and maintained uh, to actually get patents uh, prepared and filed and prosecuted. So 
that's why it's 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 not often hard to guess what a um, um, what a, a a competitor might be up to with them with um, with their patent strategy. Even though, of course, um, as, as you may may be aware, patents eventually do get published, and patent applications usually publish 18 months after they are uh, after their earliest filing date. So, it, so of course, one can always look out and see what some, what, what another uh, a, a, a potential competitor is up to, and try to guess what kind of strategy they they are, they might be pursuing. Are they super aggressive? Are they try to really uh, pursue offensive patents where they 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 they, they, they try to knock out potential competitors, or are they really just interested in protecting their own IP more for um, for defensive purposes? So, it's there's really no. No uh, one size fits all here, and, and, and it is strongly uh, case dependent and competitive dependent. So, one of the reasons why sometimes our clients come to us is because they, um, either for, for a whole host of reasons, become aware of a patent or patent application um, that um, uh, is held by a third party, by a competitor or potential competitor. Um, and, and that might pose a problem, and often enough, that's a good time to talk to your um, in-house or preferably even in, and in-house counsel and outside patent counsel to see uh, if and how problematic um, the, uh, the, 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 the patent or patent application that you found is. And sometimes um, what looks nasty at the beginning uh, may not be as nasty at all. Sometimes we have the situation that people come to us and say, oh, look, you know, this, this patent application or this patent describes exactly what, what we are doing. You know, yes, it may be in the specification. It may be in those 200 pages of body of application. But then when we look at the claims, the claims actually end up being directed to something completely different. You know, often enough, patent applications contain, for all sorts of reasons, often cost-saving reasons, descriptions of several types of inventions for, you know, or different versions of a certain invention. And for example, version A may be problematic uh, for, for, for you, but version B is actually what is eventually claimed uh, and, and, and issued in the patent, so not, a, not much of a problem. Um, and the other, the other, of course, there are other issues that um, um, arise when we say, well, you know, this is potentially a problem, and this is a potentially uh, um, uh, there's a potential infringement situation here. What can we do? Well, there are um, options to sometimes to design around uh, the patent claims to. Especially if if uh, if uh, uh, the, the, the the potentially problematic patent is spotted early in a design or an R and D process, um, sometimes there might be um, it might be the situation where a license um, the, the, or a cross license or or, or, or switch, straight up in license with a competitor might actually be feasible and make more sense. We go to the competitor and say, hey. You know, you don't really practice this. You just happen to hold this patent, but you don't really do much with it. Would you know? Can we pay you an, a lump sum of a small amount of money, and everybody goes home happy? Or um, is there another transaction that we might be able to come up with that works for both sides? And of course, if all else fails, something that there's always the, the option to do is the is, is a is a is a challenge to to. Um, to, to an existing patent, but that is a, 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 a challenge, be it, uh, of course, in the USPTO or, or in US internationally, is not to be taken lightly. These processes are very, or can be very costly, very drawn out, um, and come with a whole host of other issues. So this has to be something that definitely should be discussed with, uh, with, uh, with an experienced uh, uh, patent counsel before, before embarking on this, on this, on this trip. Um, the other thing, of course, to be keep to keep in mind, uh, again, something I, I like to reinforce because this uh, sometimes comes up when we have uh, clients come up to us and say, "Oh, we found this this patent application, this patent, and it's a real problem." Well, often enough, people come to us when they spot a pending patent application that has not yet matured into a patent um, that has a potentially problematic claim in it. As I said at the beginning, um, throughout prosecution, patent applications undergo a 
sometimes significant amendments, significant change to their, especially their claim scope, um, that may or may not um, make a potential problem go away or create a whole new one. So, so with with um, with uh, the uh, with a pending patent application, uh, it's sometimes hard to guess whether the this and uh, a patent issuing from this application really is going to be a problem, is going to be a risk, uh, if not addressed. Um, or is in the end going to be a, a non-issue because either the patent will not issue, or because the uh, the amendments will be so significant that they um, take the um, the claims out of the realm of problems for uh, for for you for our clients. So, having said that, it also cuts both ways. Of course, something that looks like not much of a big deal at the beginning may turn out to be a problem later in prosecution. So sometimes it's it's uh, it's sometimes good to to keep uh, to keep monitoring potentially problematic applications by competitors. Okay. I want to very briefly, a little sort of more briefly touch on the um, on patents on applications held by potential targets in M and A uh, transactions. Um, the risk here is a bit of a little different in in in, in an M and A context. Uh, the um, um, and the risk is here more can be more of a monetary risk from in terms of acquisition of a patent portfolio of a target. Um, so here, diligence is critical. Sometimes, um, in some small transactions, um, IP diligence is not something that is uh, it's often skipped, and this can be. Uh, yeah, can be a costly mistake, as we've, as we've, as we've, we've seen, unfortunately. Um, so, the really, it's really, it is important, even in smaller transactions that are potentially IP-related, IP-heavy, um, and even those have only tangential IP components, still to have a look, at least a cursory look at um, at what was the strategy of the target. Um, is there adequate coverage, for example, of the product that we are acquiring through our acquisition, um, or uh, is, was there was there a strategy put in place by the the, the target company that absolutely made no sense whatsoever, uh, or does not make any sense for us now as the acquirer of of this technology and of this patent portfolio? So some of these questions that need to be addressed, um, otherwise they can these things can become costly. Um, Especially if you think, well, we are acquiring a, a product that, and we are, for us, it's really important that we have a defensive patent strategy in place. That the um, that the, um, uh, the 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 product that we are interested in is adequately protected through a patent estate, a defensive patent estate. And then, uh, well, we see, okay, there are a bunch of patents filed, but really, again, look at the claims. Do they really cover? Um, to an adequate level, uh, the the product is that really the case, or was um, um, is, is the patent state unrelated to the product? Um, did it, it was it was it uh, more of a, more of a half baked strategy, um, or was there really more the, the focus on offensive patenting? So it's really important to understand what was what was going on and how and what to, the, the, of of the patent state that we are acquiring fits with our current uh, strategy and, and and direction. Um, again, of course, freedom to operate may or may not be an issue here. Uh, something that is related to uh, an analysis of the of the product, the product portfolio that is being acquired. You know, is, are there potential uh, freedom to operate issues with third parties that so far have not been an issue for us, but maybe an issue for the for the for the for, for, for the for the target being acquired? Yeah. Um, Issues can arise even with patents held by partners, by people we do business with, and sometimes on a daily basis. These can be uh, CRO CMOs um, uh, or universities or medical centers, where, for example, we uh, that often the the um, uh, founding uh, founding entities of or and founding fathers, so to speak, of uh, of uh, of either our own. Company or, or or a potential target or, or potential partner. Um, the issue here around um, the um, the patent risk is really not so much on in, in infringement, so to speak, but more of a question of do we actually own have all the rights that we really need, or do we leave ourselves open to someone down the road 
acquiring the rights uh, to, or, or to, 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 a, to a patent that should have really been all ours um, and then cre creating a potential problem. So um, again, in the CRO, CMO context, that often means that we have to have the proper um, contractual framework in place to make sure that the um, uh, the, um, uh, the client of, of, of a CRO or CMO owns or uh, all the necessary IP that, 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 the, company, that the client needs. Um, again, here the most common conveyance of those rights is through assignment, which means it's a transfer of ownership uh, of the IP rights, so to speak, uh, from from the um, from the inventor, who is the, the presumed owner, always in this case uh, uh, the in, in, inventor, for example, of a uh, uh, who is part of a CRO, and uh, then either directly conveys to the client or conveys to the CRO, and then the CRO back to the client. So. Often enough, these um, these things are standard agreements, standard um, um, yeah uh, paperwork that is um, you know industry in, has been around the industry for a long, long time. Having said that, um, the reason why I bring this up is that especially in, on, on, in, in, with, with small organizations, there are and more common than I would ima one would imagine um, still issues sometimes where this step is not done properly, where all of a sudden. Um, later in diligence, for example, say um, the, 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 the company is, uh, is being acquired by someone else, um, all of a sudden you know, diligence is being done and, 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 the, and the, the, the acquirer realizes, oh, wait a minute, this company doesn't actually really technically own what they think they own, and that can be a serious, serious issue. So um, it's important to, to, address these, uh, to address these issues head on. Um, a little different situation with universities, uh, medical centers, um, any nonprofits, government uh, labs. Um, they tend to not assign IP rights. They more, I would say, 90% of the cases. I would venture guess here. Um, hold on to the actual ownership, to the actual assignment of the IP, um, but they are often willing and more than interested on um, in licensing either exclusively or non-exclusively their rights um, in, in, in the patents and patent applications to, uh, to, uh, to a company to have it monetized, to, and then for ex exchange of royalties um, and, 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 and sort of share the upside of this, of this piece of IP. Uh, the issue here sometimes is actually not so much around the, um, the licensing aspect of the current IP, which is uh, often straightforward and, again, thousands of examples um, uh, of, of successful deals, uh, you know, since, since, especially since, in, uh, since the, uh, the, the Bayh-Dole Act came, came into, uh, came into um, existence. Um, sometimes the, uh, the issue here is more on future IP that is being uh, co-developed or, 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 or um, um, yeah, co-generated uh, under a sponsored research agreement between a company and a university Often universities will be reluctant to uh, convey rights in future IP for all sorts of, all sorts of reasons. Um, but again, something that, that, that needs to be kept in mind and, and, and potentially be addressed from the get-go. Um, very briefly, a whole different story in itself, NPEs are, are also known as patent trolls sometimes. So again, these are entities that uh, hold patents and IPs just merely for the sake of suing other uh, other entities, um, often enough, they will, you know, be interested in settling quickly for a, for a certain amount of money um, that needs to be calculated based on, um, shall we say, the uh, the price of the patent in health being uh, and, and 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 how much the the company essentially being held hostage here is willing to pay uh, for, for 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 in order to make this potential lawsuit go away. Um, Often enough, these uh, these proceedings do not start with uh, with, uh, with a straight up lawsuit, but uh, start with a nasty letter from this uh, NPE to the suspected target, uh, to, to the intended target, um, and that's usually when um, it is a good idea to call counsel, especially outside counsel, the litigation counsel who help will help with these, um, who can help you with these with these uh, with these. Uh, uh, so-called troll suits, and, and will help you to how to respond appropriately because that's a that's a certain risk associated even even if, if this is not handled properly. 
Um, so that, now that we covered mostly the, um, the probably most common risks associated with patents held by third parties, by, uh, by competitors, targets, whatnot, often overlooked is the uh, risk that is lurking actually in your own patent portfolio. So that in itself um, is a different type of risk, but uh, that's nonetheless real. So in the defensive patent context that we already talked about a little bit today, we are most concerned with the coverage of your product, of our own product. Um, it is critical, and especially if, if, if you think about either selling the company or, and, or, or, or the business unit um, or, or, or even for a, um, a potential IPO, is that one of the first things a potential investor, of course, looks at, how well am I protected against copycats, the straight-up copying of the invention, and that is where the, 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 um, um, the coverage of your product is really critical. And it is really important to understand how the current claim scope of your own patents and patent applications matches and meshes with your po uh, products and product portfolio. And um, this is really important. As, as, uh, as I said earlier, the, the patenting process is, uh, is a long, drawn-out process uh, and has not just the, the one pat or two patent applications that you may or may not start out with, you know, com covering the basic invention, but may balloon to a whole portfolio of interrelated patents and patent applications um, that can be used in, for, for various purposes. But it is easy, especially once these patent portfolios start to balloon, uh, it's, it's easy to lose focus, and it's easy to get sidetracked and maybe say, okay, well, let's go offensive first. Let's see how, how broad a coverage we can get, and maybe there's a competitor on the horizon that we want to spook or something like that. And in the meantime, you forget to uh, protect your own, your, own basic, your own basic product. Um, mistakes and can be uh, often fixed, but are often often not costly, difficult um, to fix. Um, there are ways to, 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 to either sort of claw back and see if we can sort of get coverage based on or still pending applications or reissue applications. There's the whole uh, ways of, of trying to put a, a, a genie back into the bottle, but it is difficult. It can be very, very costly. And sometimes it is not possible. Sometimes we do um, hear of cases where, you know, a client comes to a law firm and says, hey, you know, this is what, a, what, what my patent portfolio looks like, and I'm being now, uh, diligence is being done on me. Uh, and there are some concerns, and all of a sudden we realize, well, wait a minute, yes, you have you know, two issued patents and one abandoned application, but none of them cover your, your product. That's going to be a real problem that we may or may not be able to fix. Um, and again, um, I touched on this, on this already a little bit in the partnership CRO context. It is also important that all those little details are appropriately addressed and taken care of, and that is the, any issues regarding inventorship slash assignment and ownership. So that inventorship has to, i.e., who is the inventor on this patent, who made an intellectual contribution to the patent. That is important to get right. Patents can be invalidated if it's incorrect, if, if not the proper people who are intellectual contributors to at least one claim of the patent are listed on the patent. And the other thing is also assignment and ownership issues. Again, make sure that, um, the, um, that, the, uh, that the company itself actually owns the patent uh, and then has, has all the rights to uh, convey it from the inventors to the, to the company to do, to do business and to, and to, and to exploit the patents uh, as, as the company sees fit. Um, from the offensive patent point, uh, patent point of view, uh, the, again, for some, in some business cases, it may actually be almost more important to have a good offensive patent strategy than a defensive patent, patent strategy. Um, it depends, again, strongly on the industry, on the, on the type of product sometimes, or even the possibilities. Do we, can we even go broad enough to really sort of uh, spook as many uh, of our potential competitors as we can. Um, so 
Is there maybe just one specific company out there that we're sort of concerned about, or maybe one or two companies that are or competitors that are out there that we want to um, uh, be able to use patents against and potentially go out and enforce um, and have a bargaining chip on, on, or, or, or whatever we want to do with a, a potentially offensive patent? Um, does does the strategy um, fit today, as of today, maybe in the early stage of the company? Is it still the right thing to do a few years down the line? Maybe the competitor has gone out of business or, or has shifted focus. Um, important to monitor the competitor. You know, is, are they, are they, are they, is someone who's a competitor today, are they still two years from now, five years from now, you, uh, you, you, you name it? So, uh, again, also there. Uh, do we have the, uh, the 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 claim scope that we need, uh, or, or are we better off um, sort of filing or refiling certain patent applications uh, to, to 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 address uh, potential twists and turns in in the um, in the competitor's strategy? So there are all hosts of reasons that um, um, that uh, one one may want to take a. a, a a look and evaluate a patent portfolio and a growing patent portfolio at regular intervals to make sure that the original objectives, um, for example, for an offensive patent portfolio, are still there uh, and are adequately captured through the through the current filings. And again, looking at is, what is issued, what is pending, i.e., not issued yet, where, where, where's, where's white space uh, where, that, 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 that we want to cover. So all these kind of questions. Um, that we need to be addressed and monitored on a popular continuous basis. So I already touched on some of these things that I will tell you now already. Uh, what can we really do to um, to manage some of these, these issues that uh, I talked about earlier today? And so probably the uh, the really important thing is you know have have a strategy. That it's, 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 it, sounds, it sounds it sounds blunt, but it is uh, surprisingly common that um, patents are really an afterthought, even for technology companies or for or for tech or or or, um, uh, or, 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 or engineering heavy companies. You know, they say, well, you know, let's let 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 let's, let's, let's get to market quickly. Let's do this quickly. Let's you know, let's worry about patents later, or let's just file something somewhere with whatever you know. Let's just talk to some, you know, patent attorney who can just, you know, put something on file, so to speak. You know, um, but without actually having a strategy, without having a goal, without thinking of all these issues that that, that I touched on earlier: offensive, defensive, scope, non-scope. Uh, and for that, it's important that it's, it starts really within the organization itself. You know, that is in that internal, internal communication is uh, is, uh, is established uh, that um, that uh, everybody's on the same page, be it R and D, be it legal, that they all sort of talk to each other and and and, and, and know what's happening. It's, it's it's it can be very difficult or frustrating when, for example, the the um, the, the in-house counsel has no idea what really where where you know the R and D is heading. You know, where they, they somebody may have told. Council, internal council. Hey, this is our current product. Great, you know. But they are often sometimes not aware of you know what's what's the next project. What's what's two or five, ten years down the line, you know, because we need to develop a strategy that cap captures some of these these developments as early as possible. And it's important that um, as part of this communication that there is like a a, a regular review and monitoring process in place, uh, ideally. Um, that sort of where everybody gets together and says, well, you know, what, 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 what can, um, um, what's going on? What, what are we going to do, uh, IP strategy wise? And again, it can be, it can be that people walk out of this meeting and say, well, great, we're in good shape. Oh, we need that's all we'll ever need. We're good. Or is there, is there an issue? You know, and 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 cap catching and flagging potential issues early is really really key. Um, you know, so your your so, so, so the IP counsel, be it the in-house IP attorney, if there is one, and or the outside attorneys, um, such as us, uh, can really add um, a value beyond just, for example, for just the, the patent prosecution, the, 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 the getting patents on file, so to speak, step. Again, communication is key, regular check-ins with R&D and BD, preferably, 
you know, not just with legal, uh, can be extremely, extremely valuable and uh, in time and money well spent, uh, rather than sort of getting blindsided and, and, and fixing, uh, fixing mistakes later. That is almost always more costly. Yeah, so, um, very briefly, just on the on the uh, on, on, on the on the third party patent risk. Um, what again, as, as I said earlier, um, what unfortunately sometimes happens is that, especially with NPE letters or from or nasty letters from competitors alleging potential patent infringement or patent issues, um, if one does get one of those letters or emails or phone calls. It's best not to ignore. Sometimes people think, well, if I just ignore this, if I just close my eyes, it might go away. Usually they don't. Um, also, not sometimes the first reflex is to fire an email or, or phone call back and say, hey, you know, that's not true. We're not doing this, that, and the other. Usually not a good idea. The best thing is always to call counsel and say, hey, this is what we've got. This is the issue. This is the um, this is the letter that we got. Let's talk. That's really the the, the best thing you can do. Um, so this is this is really the, um, the 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 one and only thing really what one 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 should do. Um, there are and since we're talking about insurance, <laughs> insurance a little bit here, um, there are insurance products out there for um, um, you know defense insurance or abatement insurance or some some insurance products that help you uh, potentially cover costs and uh, or, or, or recuperate some costs associated with, um, say, a defense of, um, um, uh, against infringement or enforcement of your own IP rights. whole different topic in itself. That's something I personally really am, I confess, not very familiar with. I just want to sort of throw it out there that those products exist, that they're out there, but um, uh, really the the, uh, the take-home message from me, from, uh, from, 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 from our point of view, as the IP counsel to a whole bunch of uh, tech, med tech, uh, life science companies is really um, that a, a lot of risk, a lot of issues can be mitigated, can be minimized um, through simple measures that can be uh, carried out internally that are not necessarily always costly um, that we, and um, often just rely on this good communication between the various stakeholders in a, in, in a company and, 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 their, and, their, and their law firms. So. I know for that was probably a lot of information here today, um, but hopefully I, that was a useful uh, so to, to to you today to maybe think about um, some of the potential uh, issues that may or may not uh, lurk in your own uh, patent portfolio, or that uh, that may be issue as, as you as, as you do in your, go on your your day to day business and uh, and business development. And uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. All right, thank you. So we'll now begin the Q&A session. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel, which is located at the bottom right of your screen. After typing your question in the space provided, hit the Send button. Please make sure that your question is directed to all panelists in the Ask menu. We had a couple that came in during your presentation. Um, looks like the first one is, what can a, maybe a smaller company with a limited budget do to implement a smart, cost-effective strategy to manage patent risk? Right. So I think again here the 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 um, it all starts and ends really with uh, with with the, the the various stakeholders, even the very small, say ten ten uh, people and fewer company, uh, to have a, a a good level of communication between whoever, if there is a chief legal officer or if there's one legal person and R and D and BD. I think there's really um, having just regular meetings and just having. Um, a good communication that keeps the one legal person, may or may not be an attorney, in the loop about what's going on um, today and also in the uh, in, in sort of near to long term future can be extremely valuable so that then this person may or may not be able to um, um, make a call whether you know outside patent attorney or outside IP counsel uh, should be should be involved or, sh or should get involved and and maybe so provide some ad advice maybe on a on a small fee and like you know limited project kind of uh, basis a lot of IP firms will do that um, that are often money very well spent um, and so as part of that communication really it is important to uh, for example for the for the uh, R&D folks to um, 
uh, disclose inventions uh, as, as they come along to, to, to whoever the point person is, to the legal uh, or the patent, uh, internal patent person. Um, to, um, uh, for, for, to to have a uh, to, 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 to to present new developments as early as possible um, for, for 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 that person for that legal person to look into um, do some kind of very basic vetting process so that maybe some internally uh, some internal mechanism is in place to make sure that uh, valuable IP or potentially valuable IP is captured but also especially if budgets are tight. Um, that certain IP that is maybe not front and center, or that may be better protected through like trade secrets or copyrights, so you know it's, it's put in the in the appropriate you know silo bucket, so to speak, and it's not, for example, then just willy-nilly just farmed out to a patent attorney and say, hey, you know, draft a patent application on on this on this thing um, that may not be all that all that um, uh, all that valuable. Um, and so, so, so again, communication is key. Um, some companies do also things like you know they incentivize uh, even the employees to to to, to disclose um, early and often. You know have, that can work. You have to be a little bit careful that you know that that, that this does not result in a lot of sort of not so valuable um, IP being disclosed internally. That as uh, then then it clogs up them the process and it needs to be vetted carefully internally. So, so a few things again here that uh, that can be done really on a, on a on a, on even a, on, on little to no budget at all, and that, that will also really in the long run minimize um, minimize costs spent on outside counsel. Okay, thank you. Looks like we just got another one in. So, this person says we've received a letter from a patent owner alleging that we've infringed their patent. What do we do? So yeah. So again, as as, as, I, as I said earlier, so these these are um, uh, these kind of, sort of nasty grants, as some people call them. Um, again, can be uh, can be just a sort of frivolous suit. Can be um, in a, 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 a from a, a, a sort of non real competitor and non practicing entity that just you know goes out and tests the waters and see if, if if you if you react and say okay fine we will settle straight away and pay you, you know, the, the requested amount of money that's often in, in these letters um, or is this really something more serious you know is this really a, a potentially existential risk to the to, to them to the to the to the company here you know so uh, it depends of course, that depends on who the other side is is it a real competitor like a, like a, like someone who's really in the same practice in the same field or someone who just more like tangentially or not at all in the same field so this is sometimes hard to gauge without having looked at the patents that are being asserted, uh, without having looked at the history of this uh, of the um, of the the patent owner. Uh, is it the first time they sued someone? Is it the is it the twentieth time that they try to enforce this patent? So these are all the kind of questions that uh, inform the strategy in response to uh, these um, these. Um, Pre pre lawsuit uh, letters, um, and the, the best thing here really is uh, is to not one hand not ignore and hope it's going to go away. Usually it doesn't, um, but really just to pick up the phone and uh, of course if it's um, uh, you know, first of all of course in, in get get internal legal uh, involved and depending on the sophistication of course of, of the internal legal department it's a large company it's a different story but for a lot of these especially small to medium sized whatever companies uh, really then call the a, 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 a patent council of of, uh, of, of your choice um, I, um, ideally someone who has a they will either will have someone uh, an, uh, an experienced litigator on staff or can refer someone who then will take a closer look and analyze a, um, this, uh, this this letter um, in very basic terms and then sort of, uh, can advise whether it's best to for now ignore and not respond and do nothing or whether you know a carefully crafted, again, usually by the outside attorney, response should follow uh, to this uh, to, to, to this letter alleging infringement or, or, or alleging some kind of other IP-related um, uh, inappropriate conduct, so to speak. Um, the, 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 the outside attorney is usually the best suited person to to address this issue um, uh, and uh, and then hopefully resolve in a timely and especially cost-effective manner. 
Okay, thanks. I know we're right up against the hour here, but I hope we can squeeze in just this last question. And the question is, if a patent for a specific delivery system of a generic medication has been granted, and then it is learned that there are competitors making the same product prior to the patent being granted, it, does that constitute infringement? So the um, so the, the, the it, it does not matter whether the um, uh, the, uh, the 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 product that is allegedly infringing was in existence before the patent was granted. So once the patent is granted, that product is potentially infringing. This is a, so in, on very very general terms, without of course you know looking at the at, at, at the details here. But yeah, there's there's no um, there's no um, issue regarding regarding. Um, uh, timing of 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 the of the um, of the, the the allegedly infringing product coming out air or being being released and marketed versus uh, the the patent being granted. Of course, there are issues associated with that. Potentially, that one could say, well, you know, if this um, if this product has already been on the market for. Um, 20, 15, 15, 20, or how many years, it is very strange that there's a patent granted on, on, on something that's allegedly the same thing. But yeah, so that's the, in, in very basic terms, there's, 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 the, the, the time differences should, should not matter. Okay, thank you so much. I know that's all the time we have. We really appreciate your presentation. I know um, patents are a confusing issue, and a lot of you know, startup and smaller life science companies really benefit from this information. So we really appreciate your presentation, Dr. Ogg. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.